Good day learners, welcome to another lab for ComSci 132 Computer Architecture. In this lab, we're going to look into how a processor is designed and implemented. Specifically, we're going to look into the different elements that make up a processor. We will also attempt to implement some components using VHDL, which I hope you are already familiar with since you are done with the previous labs. We will also need in this lab your knowledge in ComSci 130 Digital Design. Let's get started. This lab is divided into two parts, one for combinational and another for sequential, hence the title. We will differentiate the two later. The source codes used in this lab is available in the link provided. All source codes are hosted on GitHub, so you can access them anytime. The ESD Labs link contains tutorials for VHDL, in case you need additional resources for VHDL. The textbook by Patterson and Hennessy is the main source of the topics in this lab, specifically from Chapter 4 and the Appendix. Programs written in high-level languages like C must be converted to machine language before the processor can execute them. The processor understands only the machine language it knows based on its architectural design or instruction set architecture. Machine language is difficult to write for humans Thus, assembly language is used. Uh, the code on the left is an example assembly language program for a 16-bit Intel x86 processor. So this uh, part here is an example uh, source code. We have uh, the first three lines as the assembler directives. This tells the assembler to generate 16-bit code load this program at this memory address 7c00 then generate instructions for x8086 processor this is the main uh, part of our program we have the section then this is a label and the actual uh, assembly language instruction the assembler converts the assembly language program to machine language saved as a binary file. This is the output of the assembler. In the dump of boot sector that bin, you can see the equivalent machine code for the assembly code. You can see this is the assembly code and this is the equivalent machine code. Machine code is generated sequentially per instruction. The move instruction generates a 2-byte machine code placed at byte offset 0 and 1. So this uh, assembly language instruction will generate 2 bytes of machine code at offset 0 and at offset 1. And the numbering will proceed. So this is offset 2, offset 3. So in the case of uh, the end instruction here, this is also a 2-byte machine code starting at offset 4 and ending at offset 5, which uh, basically 2 bytes. The binary file is loaded into memory after which execution can begin. Typically, it is uh, the job of the operating system to load the binary into memory However, in this example, it is the BIOS that reads the boot sector from the disk and places the contents at address 0x7c00. So this figure on the right shows the boot sector code running in the QMU emulator after the BIOS has read it from the boot device and placed it at 0x7c00. I attached a debugger to trace its execution. As you can see in this code, I set a breakpoint at the 7C00 so that I can see the execution of uh, the bootloader program starting at this address. And then 
I continue the execution and you can see here the instruction pointer for the program counter which marks the address of the next instruction to be executed so you have the code here which is the same here and which is the same here so your original assembly language program before being uh, executed by the processor has to go through these steps and of interest to us in comsci 132 is to understand how does the processor execute this instruction and we are already given a hint a one is one functional unit that is important is this program counter or instruction pointer which tells the processor the address of the next instruction to be executed If you are given the task to write a processor that will execute the instructions like move, end, or add, as in the previous slide, how should we begin? So first, let us begin with some definition. The first one is data path. Data path is the component of the processor uh, that uh, performs the arithmetic operations. It is often called the brawn of the processor, the data path. Second one is control, which is the component of the processor that commands the data path, memory, and I.O. devices according to the instructions of the program. And it's often called the brain of the processor. So these two work uh, tandem to be able to execute instruction. Now, there are several logic elements in the data path. And the first one are called uh, combinational elements. Combinational elements are those that operate on data values, bit values. The main characteristic of combinational elements is that the outputs depend only on the current inputs. Given the same input, a combinational element always produces uh, the same uh, output. Example of that is the ALU or the arithmetic and logic unit. Now, the second uh, logic elements in the data path are called state elements or sequential elements. Uh, these elements contain state and has some uh, internal storage and the main characteristic is that uh, if we saved and restore the state elements it would be as if the computer had never lost power in case you power on the or the power off the computer examples of these logic elements are uh, the instruction and data memories and registers it has at least uh, two inputs and one output the actual data then there is a clock input and then the output is data example of this is the d type flip-flop the clock determines when the state element should be written and it can be read at any time Clocking methodology, uh, the signals are the values in the lines or wires connecting the circuitry. So if the signal is asserted, meaning there is a current or there is a value in that particular signal. Now, clocking methodology defines when signals can be read or when they can be written. The idea here is to make the hardware more predictable because if we don't have a specific clocking methodology, you never know when to read, when to write, and there might be some problems. Problems occur if the signal is written at the same time that it is read. The value of the read could respond to the old value, correspond to the old value, uh, the new value written, or a mix. So that basically uh, results to error. 
An example of uh, clocking methodology is called edge triggered clocking. This means that any values stored in a sequential logic element are updated only on the clock edge. So this is, uh, these are signals. When you have signals, you have uh, some patterns. See this in the next slide. Now, edge triggered means that there is a, uh, there's a quick transition from low to high or a high to low. We are talking about digital signals. I think in ComSci 130, the first topic uh, is a discussion of analog and digital signal. So an example is an edge triggered uh, clock. Okay, so an edge triggered methodology allows a state element to be read and written in the same clock cycle without creating arrays that could lead to indeterminate data values. Arrays condition happens when there is inconsistency in the values currently stored in a state element and what is recently read from it. We want to avoid this condition since this will lead to errors. So as you can see here in the figure, there is a, a the basic uh, loop of the progression. So you have a state element here, and then the state elements usually store information. Then it goes on to the combinational logic, perhaps an ALU, and then the result or some computations or logic operations. Then the result goes back again to the state element. So this is called a, a, a cycle, a single cycle. And uh, the writing on the state element, the reading happens only uh, during the edge of the clock. Transition from high to low or low to high. So here we have an example positive edge trigger. So edge triggering would mean the transition from low to high or high to low. Positive edge triggering would mean from low to high. So you can see here, so this is the clock cycle. This is the initial signal low and then abruptly it becomes high. And this is what you call a positive edge trigger. And this is the time when you can uh, do something on the state element. Then the signal, the clock signal will proceed, uh, will continue having a high value and then suddenly it will uh, go down again, low, high to low. Is the say the ALU performing some operations? Then it is only again on the another positive uh, uh, change of the clock signal will the data be written to the uh, state element. So in the case of the previous example here, so the state element one and state element two are the same. Now, the clock cycle length, as defined here, uh, is the time to propagate the signal from state element 1 through the combination, combinational element and uh, finally state element 2. So this parameter, clock cycle length, is important in evaluating the performance of the processor. So we have here an example of a single cycle data path. When you say single cycle, it means that in one clock cycle, the instruction being executed should have been completed. Now let's look at the functional components in this data path. So this is a typical uh, structure and the typical components, functional components of the data path. So let's look first at the program counter. So the program counter stores the address of the next instruction. It is equivalent to the IP, as I mentioned a while ago. Then the next element is the instruction memory or IM. So this is a memory a logic element, basically a sequential logic element, which stores the instructions or the machine language of the program. If we're going to relate this to the previous uh, 
discussion on the 16-bit program, the PC here will be the, uh, let's look, tracing the execution, the PC will be equal, will be the equivalent of the IP and uh, going back to the execution, the value will be 7C00. This is the value of the program, which is actually an address. An address is basically an index to the instruction memory. And the instruction memory contains the machine language program. If we go back to the first slide here. So this is the instruction. So in the memory, B001, that will be, if this is the memory, okay, so let's say this is address 7C00, somewhere here, the value of the memory is B001. And this is the instruction obtained in this memory location. So this instruction will be passed, will be decoded, and we said that this instruction is move AL01. Okay. So this instruction has uh, a parameter or, or an operand, which is a register. So another functional component of uh, a data path is the register file. So the register file will have AL here, it's basically a storage, a fast storage compared to the instruction memory. Okay. This will be used to uh, for the computation. Then the next one is the ALU. So PC ALU uh, registers. So the ALU performs the arithmetic and uh, logic operation. This instruction move AL uh, comma zero one does not involve any computation, so it will not uh, utilize the ALU. Then. The next component is the data memory. So the data memory is uh, contains the data in your program. So there are some instructions that read and write to the data memory. So uh, it is placed here also as one of the functional components in the uh, data path. And uh, as shown here, there are also two others. The others are responsible. The first one is for incrementing the uh, program counter so that it will move to the next instruction. So in this example, if there is no jump instruction, it will simply increment by four, and then that will be the address of the next instruction. In the case of uh, the example a while ago, after the execution of the move AL01, it will, it will become, uh, IP will become 7C02. The last, the end, it will continue to execute. Now, this one is uh, useful if you have uh, jump instructions because uh, you have to determine the exact location where the program counter will be set not just by increment, incrementing it by four. So you can see here that at this point, there will be uh, uh, two sources. It can be from a jump instruction or from the normal execution. So we need additional device for that, which we will discuss uh, in the succeeding slide. Okay, now, now this uh, figure here illustrates a single cycle data path uh, with functional components and control. In the previous slide, we don't have any control component. Here we have the control component. Again, the control component is the brain of the processor. It actually controls the activation. Let's say the activation of the different functional components. Uh, the functional components without the control will just be sitting idle, but it is the control that triggers the activation of the different functional components. The processor makes progress in its execution because of a clock 
that continuously generates a signal which is used by the sequential elements. So ALU is an example of uh, a combinational element. Data memory, registers, instruction memory, program counter, these are examples of uh, sequential elements. And uh, their updating, reading, and writing is based on the presence of a clock. As shown in this slide is the control unit that determines which functional unit will be active when an instruction is being executed. So it's interesting to look, to know that uh, modern processors operate using the von Neumann architecture, which follows the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. Now looking at this uh, illustration, this diagram you can actually identify which components in this diagram are responsible for or are used in the different stages in the fetch decode execute cycle so we can actually specify them for example uh, we can divide this line we can say that this is the instruction fetch, meaning during the execution, uh, this will be the part wherein the instruction specified by the program counter will be uh, used to determine, to, to get, to retrieve the next instruction, which is this one. So this is the instruction fetch. Now, after the instruction has been fetched, there will be the instruction decode. So instruction decode will cover until this point. So in the instruction fetch, the active components are program counter and the instruction memory. Now in the instruction decode, the main components involved are the registers and the control unit. Then, uh, the next stage is the execution. So, fetch, decode, execute, which is until this point. It use, actively uses the ALU. Then, if after the computation or the execution, it has to write something to the data memory, this will be the part. So the result of the computation can be uh, stored in the data memory. And then the last one is the write back. So these are usually the stages of the execution. Instruction fetch, uh, instruction decode, execute, memory, and write back. And uh, the, word, the, the this, compartment, this compartment represents the functional components that are active during these stages. Okay, so I hope uh, that uh, uh, explains the functional components associated with each stage of the fetch decode execute cycle. Let us now focus on the combinational building blocks. Our goal is to uh, somehow implement at the end of comps I want you to at least to be able to implement some of the elements here and today we're going to focus on the ALU and uh, this requires the understanding of combinational building blocks please note that the discussions will that will follow will not be as detailed as in comps I 130 we will focus only on the essentials that relate to processor design. So let's start with uh, decoders. Okay. So decoders accepts an in-bit input and produces two to the n outputs. In this example, we have three bits as input and two to the three, our n is three bits, and two to the three is eight. So we have one, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, all in all. 
only one output is asserted and the one that uh, this out the the output that is asserted is the one that corresponds to the binary of the in bit n bit input as you can see here if the inputs are uh, 0 0 0 then the output will be the one that will be activated will be out 0 so this one here this case so that's uh, an example of how a decoder works so this is the truth table and your task for example is to uh, design or implement a decoder so this is a 3 to 8 decoder 3 inputs 2 to the 3 outputs 3 to 8 uh, decoder and to implement that in VHDL this will be the implementation so I tried to map the variables with the implementation the variables in the truth table with the implementation so you have i2 i1 i0 i2 i1 i0 funding and then the different outputs out 7 out 6 out 5 make it easier to read all of them are standard logic meaning just simple signals and then this will be the actual implementation. I'm sure in ComSci 130 that the trick has been discussed on how to implement this. For example, this to activate this one, you simply uh, use these uh, terms. Disable everything and you get this. That's how it's done. And uh, this will continue by just setting the appropriate uh, input. If it is on, put it uh, on. Okay. So to test this, so you have this uh, uh, command line to determine whether the uh, decoder will work. So the next component that you are interested in is the multiplexer or selector. Multiplexer is another combinational element building block. Uh, it selects which input will be allowed to pass through as output. In this example, uh, we have uh, two data inputs, A and B, and one selector input, S. Now, S will select which of A or B will become C. If the value of S is 0, then C will become A. If the value of S is 1, then C will become B. And this is the logic gate uh, representation of that. And thus, this can easily be implemented in VHDL. Now, this multiplexer can be generalized as N data. Uh, if you are given N inputs, Okay. Uh, it will require uh, so if you are given n inputs how many selector bits do you need so the number of selector bits is given by plug uh, 2 n so here we have two inputs then we need one selector bit if we have four inputs then we need Two selector bits. Okay, we have uh, eight inputs. Then we need three selector bits. So that's the generalization. This is our implementation of the one bit two to one multiplexer. It's named as MOOX two to one. We have the inputs A, B, S. Our standard logic and we have the output C and we simply use the logic gates so A and not B uh, A and not S will be that term then B and S this will be B and then S and then we or that to get the C very straightforward
implementation in VHDL. So let's look at the test bench signal port mapping. I'd like to call your attention on some tips in creating the test bench. So to make things easier, we make the inputs as a bit string or a bit vector as shown. For example, if you want to test the 1-bit 2 to 1 multiplexer, we set the input as a vector or a bit string, 2 down to 0. So this is a 3-bit string. Okay? However, you have to be careful to use the correct mapping of the input bits to the ports of the component. Consider the input bit string 110. So in our test, in my test, I created this input bit string 110. In the map mapping defined, the most significant bit in this input is input 2. So uh, our input is uh, 110. Okay. The most significant bit here is this one and the least significant bit is this one okay and the idea here is to map it uh, properly for example so this will be uh, offset 0 1 2 so what we do here is the selector is mapped to input 2 which is the most significant bit. So this is the selector. If this is 1, that means we're choosing B. If this is 0, that means we're choosing A. And then we map A uh, to input 1. We map input 1 to A. So this is will be the A, and this will be the B, and this will be the selector. This is our format. So you have to be careful when testing the component. And writing the test bench so that you will you will not be confused or your test will not fail so this is the mapping that we did and of course we should expect correctly for example we have 0 1 0 so this is a this is b this is s so we select a so we assert that the output should be 1 because a is 1 when s equals 0 okay so to test this uh, code, the, these are the steps to do that. Now, normally we design the basic elements uh, using one bit only. We can, however, extend the design to support multiple bits by cascading one bit, ele one bit elements as shown. So here you have an array of one bit multiplexers to select from uh, two 64-bit uh, inputs. So you basically just, this is the notation. So uh, 64, 63 bits is 0 to 63. Then this is the uh, array, array or the cascading connections. So I have an example, but instead of uh, cascading 64 bits, I just used four bits. And this is the implementation. So it's a MOOCs, uh, two, uh, four bit, two to one MOOCs. And uh, the inputs will be A and B. But instead of just being bits, it's actually the inputs will be uh, four bits, uh, index from uh, three down to zero. Then the selector remains the same. You only have one bit selector. And then the output uh, will be the, will also be a bit vector. We have uh, end books for B. And what we do here is to simply utilize the MOOCs 2 to 1, the 2 to 1 multiplexer 1 bit, and then use the generate uh, keyword in VHDL to be able to generate the required number of uh, 2 to 1. Uh, multiplexers to support our 4-bit multiplexers. So the trick here is instead of using just A, B, and C, we simply use the index I here to generate the 4-bit uh, values, to, to generate the 4-bit uh, uh, multiplexer. 
but the selector is the same for all of the instances of the 2 to 1 multiplexer. So this is the test bench of that. Uh, okay, so you have the inputs here. So we have first one is the input A is a bit vector for bit 0011. In, and input B is 1000, which is again four bits. And then the selector is zero. When we test this, we should assert that the output, since the selector uh, is set to zero, it should output uh, 0011, which is A. And for the other test, if we set selector to one, the expected output should be E. But instead of this, of just using one bit, we have four bits for this example. That's how uh, we tested the previous uh, four bit two to one multiplexer. So now we are going to construct a one bit ALU that performs AND, OR, and ADD. Given the previous call combinational building blocks, let us create a 1-bit ALU. Our ALU will have two 1-bit uh, data inputs, A and B, uh, a selector operation, and one output bit called result. Okay. So uh, the ALU would be something like this. Do the drawing. We have uh, A, we have B, then we have the operation, carry in, we have result, we have carry out. I think I have a slide here. Ah, I have a slide here. Anyway, so before we proceed with the full uh, 1 bit ALU. Let's try to build uh, the AND and OR uh, component together. So, this is our uh, AND and OR component. So in this design, if the selector is 0, then the result is the AND of A and B. Okay. And then, if the selector is set, the operation, so the operation is the selector. So this is actually a 2 to 1 MOOCs. This one here, this component is a 2 to 1 MOOCs. And this will be the behavior. So as you can see here, we compose the end or component by using the component uh, construct. So we need uh, one MOOCs 2 to 1. So this is that component. Then component, uh, another component will be the AND gate. And then the last component will be the OR gate. So when we compose this, this will be U1, the diagram. This will be U2, and this will be U3. And this is the implementation. To fully implement this, we simply connect the wires. And this is the connection. So A and B for the unit 1, A and B, the result is stored in U here then for unit 2 uh, a and b the result is stored to b that is be here and then what will serve as inputs to the multiplexer will be the outputs of the n and or so that will those are in u and in v so you have u v and then the operation which is just a single bit one and then the result and we have now implemented the end or component easily by just uh, interconnecting the different components so this is an example uh, test bench as i mentioned a while ago you have to be careful with the mapping so that you will correctly test the component so this is our mapping. Uh, since 
uh, what I did in the mapping is I set the most significant uh, bit. Okay, so this is input two, the most significant bit of the input, input two as the operation. So as you can see here, the first, uh, the most significant bit, zero, zero here, would select uh, end, and then the next one will select, uh, one will select or, uh, this one will select end. So zero, zero, end zero, zero should output zero. Uh, and zero one output zero uh and one zero output zero and one one output one etc etc so again please uh take note of the proper mapping of your inputs to the ports of your components uh I, it took me a lot of time to fix this bug because i made the wrong uh, mapping and uh, of course i made some uh, wrong inputs also that's why i'm sharing this to you now let's look at the other components so we are done with the end very easy to implement the or uh, component of the alu very easy to implement now let's move on to the other element okay? and uh, this is the block diagram of our other which is which will be used to implement the add operation so the other would require denoted by a plus sign here as uh, the block diagram will have two inputs a and b bits and then it will also accept a carry in then a carry out then the sum so this is the truth table for example if a is zero and b is one and then the carry and carry in is one then the out the carry this output will be carry out will be zero then the sum will be zero because uh, one plus one is two. You get the idea. So I think in ComSci 130, this also was discussed thoroughly how to design, how to find the expression for this uh, other example. But we'll skip the process of deriving the uh, equations. Okay, so I have here a link to a YouTube video on how to do that. But let's focus on the first component because there are two outputs in the other here. We have two outputs. We have the sum and the carry out. So let's focus on the carry out first. So in the carry out, so this will be the circuit diagram because uh, the carry out uh, will simply be uh, one. Okay. The inputs in the the outputs uh, is one. If this will be the inputs, which basically a subset of the truth table here. So simply look at which uh, combination of inputs will result to a one in the carry out. Okay. So these are the combination of inputs that will lead to one, and we can have this circuit to do that right so the carry out will just be uh, this circuit okay and regarding the sum this is the uh, expression the long expression of the sum but uh, it's quite complex and it requires a lot of uh, gates so this is actually uh, you still recall yung, uh, we call it sum of products in uh, uh, OMSI 130. So this is quite uh, long. So what we can do is introduce the XOR component, okay? exclusive OR. And uh, by using Boolean algebra, we can actually reduce the sum to this simple expression. A, X or B, X or carry in. And that will be the value of the sum. And given this information, we can now implement our full other in this manner. So the sum, so this is our uh, interface to the, com to the component. We have A, B for the inputs. We have the carry in. We have the sum. Then we have the carry out. And then simply use the previously derived expressions 
and directly convert them to the HDL syntax and we now have the uh, full adder component. Okay. So now we're ready to design the final uh, one bit ALU by integrating all the components. This is the final design. Okay. So as you can see, uh, we have the end component, the or component, and the other component, and we have the selector here. However, there is an issue. Okay. In the original end or design, our 2 to 1 multiplexer will suffice. However, since we require three operations in our ALU, we need to have uh, a selector that selects just uh, not just from two uh, two items but rather more than two so in this case we need a four to one multiplexer because we have three options zero one two so this will in binary this will be zero zero this will be zero one three one zero and one one so we have a free uh slot for our selector but so far what we've designed only is the one bit two to one multiplexer our next goal is to design a four to one multiplexer so how do we do that so we can actually combine the two to one multiplexers to create a four to one multiplexer in this slide we see how to build a four to one multiplexer by using three 2 to 1, 1 bit, 3, uh, 3, uh, 1 bit, 2 to 1 multiplexers. Actually, you can uh, make it easier. Uh, you can, it's actually easier to create a multi 4 to 1 multiplexer by just using the case statement in VHDL. However, what I want to illustrate here is that you can build complex components from simple ones by properly connecting them. So as you can see here, our 4 to 1 multiplexer would require four inputs a b c d and i mentioned a while ago that the number of selector lines is log two to the n so this will be two two selector lines s0 and s1 and then the output will be e we have four input data inputs a b c d we have two selector lines s0 and s1 then we have the final output E. And by just looking at this diagram and interconnecting the components, we will be able to get the to implement the 4 to 1 multiplexer. So we simply connect A, B, and then use S1 as the selector. Then C, D, I also use S1 as the selector. And then the final multiplexer, so this will be U1. This will be U2, this will be U3, and uh, you can see now the interaction of the components and you get the final value e here. Okay, so this is how we implement the 4 to 1 multiplexer using 2 to 1 multiplexer. So finally, we can now have the final design and implementation of our 1 bit ALU that supports uh, end, or, and add. This is our final code. So we have the ALU entity with three in, uh, with these inputs, A, B, carry in, and the operation uh, to make it more uh, consistent, uh, I just used a vector. So this will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So zero zero, uh, this will be map to S zero. This will be map to S one. That's what uh, happens here. And uh, we need three inputs. Now we have a, va a dummy variable here x because x is supposedly here, but it is not used. So we have a free. Uh, 
selector line here, but uh, this is our code. So for U1, we simply connect, uh, we use an end gate, connect A and B, and then output the U. Then the OR gate, uh, connect A and B, and output it as a V. Then the full adder, okay, A and B, and the carry in, uh, you store, uh, store the output to W, and then the carry out is set here. And you have now the one bit uh, ALU that we decided to implement a while ago. And uh, for the last part, we have the test uh, test bench for the ALU. Okay. So what you can see here is that we have uh, uh, three operations, three test, uh, four test cases. One and one, uh, one and one or one, one plus one, then one plus zero. So let's take a look at one and one. So again, it's important that the mapping is correct. So as I said a while ago, uh, the most significant bits are used for the mapping for the operation. So zero zero is end, zero one is or, one zero is. Uh, add one zero is add and then uh, the map next mapping is uh, the carry in so this is the carry in then a is this one and b is this one so in the case of one and one so this is the instruction the code is zero zero it will perform an end a and b is one and one therefore the result should be one so this result should be correct if our ALU design is correct. Now, if we have an OR, 0, 1, this is the code, and then 1 and 1, we we'll also get a 1 because we have a 1 operation, uh, an OR operation. Then 1 plus 1, okay, uh, so 1, 0 is the add operation, the carry in is 0, 1 plus 1 is 0. That's why we have here but the carry out here i should have added that the carry out should be one for the correct test case and then this one uh one plus zero again the add operation and then one and zero correct answer should be one but the carry out should be, i should also put an assert here i should have put an assert for the carry out when using the addition operation so uh, I hope uh, that's clear. Okay. So that finalizes our discussion on how to design a one-bit uh, ALU by uh, building uh, different. Uh, smaller components and assembling them into one big component. So to show some source code, I think I have a few source code here. Okay. So I have in the repository the source code, latest source code. So let's look at the ALU component. This is the final code of the ALU. And let's try the ALU. Let's look at the ALU sign. This is the actual code for the ALU, the final code that we have. And let's look at the test bench. By adding, let's try adding some uh, test bench. ALU. I already have here a few tests. Okay. So uh, I have this test here. Okay. This last test here, so this is the add operation one zero, and then the carry in is uh, bit is set to one, and then a is one and b is zero. Okay, so the expected output of this is since I'm performing an add one plus zero plus one should be zero. Okay, so let's see if it is correct. So GHDL minus A 
tell you cannot identify load identity full other do we have a full other here full other so let's uh I renamed some files a while ago, so Right. Have to build, rebuild everything. work now so everything worked so let's try adding another test so let's try an addition with uh, So the test failed. So why did it fail? We are adding one and one, and then the carry in is one. So the output should be the result should be one. Okay. For the result. there everything now is working as expected we want uh, we did not generate a vcd file but you can actually look at the vcd file in gtk wave uh, later so there you have it uh, i hope you enjoyed this uh, discussion on the combinational uh, component or combinational elements used in designing data paths We'll continue this in the next video on uh, sequential element. Thank you very much for listening.